I have a cool Bible study for us this morning. Um, so as many of you know, I was gone for the last couple of days. I was in um, Salt Lake City, Utah for our, our brother Jorge Perez's wedding. Um, it was a really good time, guys. And um, it's always fun going to weddings. If you haven't gone to a lot of weddings, like go to a lot of weddings. They're, they're <laughs> so much fun. Um, but you just get to, to remember like the, the, the funniest memories, like the most embarrassing memories about one of your friends is the greatest thing. Because I even remember this. You, some of you guys in this room might, probably not. Um, but Jorge Perez, who he leads the campus ministry there in our church in Salt Lake City. And um, we knew each other back in college. He was a student at a different university, but we would meet like at staff on Tuesdays and like different like, um, you know, kind of sparingly meeting of the bodies. But he, uh, it was like 2018. He was probably the only person in 2018 with the frosted tips. Oh, yeah. Hair dye? Yeah. Had the frosted tips all up in his hair. It was the funniest thing. Um, but that was my first um, um, time meeting Jorge. Um, and I still don't think, I don't think I've ever seen anyone else try and rock that look since then. You know, so good for those people. But, um, but I, I, I love weddings so much. I love weddings so much. And um, they're just good fun. And weddings are used a lot in the Bible. And I always get reminded how much weddings, ceremonies, and banquets, and, and, and covenants are mentioned and used in Scripture mm -hmm. to help us understand God. I always remember, I'm reminded how much that is mentioned in the Scriptures when I go to weddings. Yeah. Um, just to throw a couple of them out, um, you don't have to turn there, but um, in Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13, there's a parable where Jesus, he describes ten virgins who were betrothed, but only five of them eagerly prepared themselves for the wedding while the other five just weren't bothered enough to, to, to be ready for their wedding ceremony, which is really weird if you know anything about going to weddings. Yeah. Um, in John 3.29, Jesus refers to himself as the bridegroom. Um, Ephesians 5 refers to the church as the bride of Christ. So there's so much material in the Bible on this subject. So I thought we'd turn to Matthew 22. And study one of them out. Matthew chapter 22. And we are going to start in verse 1. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off one to his field and another to his business. The rest seized his servants and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite, and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to his came to see his guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are invited, but few are chosen. Seems like a very interesting, kind of like even difficult to understand parable. Why is is, is he using such kind of a crazy, like I've been to a lot of weddings and I've never seen one like this, that like happened like this, you know? Um, but for starters, I think we got to notice how amazing, like amazingly prepared this wedding banquet was mm -hmm. in this passage. So in Luke 14, there's the parable, the parallel account to this parallel, I mean, to this parable. I keep getting my parables and parallels mixed up. Um, but 
in Luke 14, it says that the king had prepared a great banquet and he had invited many, right? And I was reading this and the first thing that came to my mind was, um, some of you guys know them, um, Kirk and Allie's wedding. Yeah. Yeah. That was second to, to, my, to our wedding. That was my favorite wedding I've ever been to. Dude, so Kirk is like full blown, 100% Filipino and Ali 100% Vietnamese. The food we had that weekend could feed a small village for sure. It took like two grown men to carry this like entire like roasted pig. They had every rice dish you could imagine every chicken dish you could imagine, every noodle dish you could imagine. We had duck. It was like, by the time we got to the cake, I'm like a sweet tooth type person. I couldn't even eat the cake. There was so much food. This was a great banquet. So when I, I read the scripture and it says that, that, that the king, he prepared a great banquet and he invited many. I, I, I think of something like that. I'm like, dang, that's sick. That like God has something so incredible prepared for those that he's invited. Mm -hmm. Like that's so amazing. It takes so much work to put on a mediocre wedding. Yeah. Like a, a eh, wedding is hard to pull off. Mm -hmm. But God's prepared something incredible. God has such great lengths to, to, to give us something amazing. But in God's eyes, the way he views his relationship with uh, most of the world is in the next couple of verses is that there's people that just could not be bothered yeah. with an invitation and on top of that it says he sent them personal like escorts to get them from their house to the wedding i'm like dog i drove five and a half hours to get to my friend's wedding yesterday yeah. <laughs> like they got like i was, I was going to read the scripture to Jorge, be like hey bro like what the heck man like, I drove the whole way by myself, you know, and no, no limo up here for me or anything like that, you know? But seriously, he got, it says that God sent a personal escort to every single person that was invited to this wedding banquet for his son. And they blew him off. Blow me off one time like that, I'm probably never talking again. He sent him another time. He sent the escorts twice. And then the second time it says that some of his servants were killed. And it's like, wow, this is like a really interesting like relationship dynamic between this king and like kind of his people that he's invited. Like, why would you invite people like that? Now, the thing we have to understand is, you know, Jesus is obviously he's preaching this parable about 2000 years ago. And when he's trying to help the, the, the Israelites understand, he's trying to help them to understand their history. He's trying to help them understand that every single time that Israel drifted from God, he would send them prophets. Mm -hmm. And right now, as he's preaching this, these prophets are like highly revered and respected and honored, like, like uh, people like Isaiah, people like uh, Elijah, people like Jeremiah. Is they, 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 they had such reverence towards these prophets. Their, their, their very names are very respectable. But they forget that it was their ancestors that persecuted and killed every single one of those prophets. Mm -hmm. And in the first century, they just totally forgot, like, yeah, about 500 years ago, we, like, killed all the prophets. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they treated them with such contempt, but now all of a sudden, like, they've kind of changed their energy. And they try and forget, like, kind of all the, 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 the bad things that they've done in their history, which we know it's not a good idea just to forget all of your mistakes. Mm -hmm because you're just going to kind of repeat them, yeah. which funny enough, they did with Jesus, right? Yeah. So they did exactly what their ancestors had done to the prophets, but they did it to God, you know? So yeah. good job for getting your mistakes, right? We're trying to cover them up at least, but he's trying to help them understand their history so they can understand not to repeat those same mistakes, but he's like, man, like God is a king and he's prepared an incredible wedding banquet for all that he's invited and you guys just don't want to come. We can look here in Hosea chapter 4 as well. And the title for our lesson, by the way, is The Wedding Banquet. We're just going to study out some weddings. 
So I know all, all the sisters will be fired up about that. It's so funny. Every every time we do, you know, like uh, uh, just the, the wedding week festivities and it, you know, just comes out that the sister has been planning, you know, her wedding since she was just a little girl and, you know. If I can find Hosea, here we go. We're going to look in chapter 4. But guys, I, I, I think that the, the takeaway from that parable that we just read is we got to ask ourselves some very simple questions. Is, have you been putting God on the back burner? Is, has God been, been worth your time lately? Right? Because we can get really busy and have hectic lifestyles and it's just like, we can struggle like in, in, our, in, our, in our actions really is like in, in our minds we would never say this like, like with words that God is not worth our time yeah. but like how many of our actions would reflect some of the attitudes of those people who were invited mm-hmm. to God's banquet is God has to be worth your time right but in Hosea chapter 4 we're going to read verse uh, 6 and um, I'll catch you guys up on the first three chapters in a second, but this is the excerpt we're going to read. And um, verse 6 says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. Because you've rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of your God, I also will ignore your children. The more the priests increased, the more they sinned against me. They exchanged their glory for something disgraceful. They feed on the sins of my people. They relish their wickedness. And it will be like people, like priests. I will punish both of them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. They will eat but not have enough. They will engage in prostitution but not increase. Because they have deserted the Lord to give themselves to prostitution, to old wine and new. Which they take, which take away the understanding of my people. They consult a wooden idol and are answered by a stick of wood. A spirit of prostitution leads them astray. They are unfaithful to their God. They sacrifice on the mountaintops and burn offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth, or where the shade is pleasant. Therefore, your daughters turn to prostitution and your daughter-in-laws to adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Super intense passage. What does this have to do with weddings? Really good question. Uh, So the prophet here, Hosea, um, his story is quite tragic. Um, So this book written by Hosea about his time period, um, so the 10 northern tribes of Israel had separated from the northern kingdom at the time, and um, they had both turned to a very dark, evil idolatry. They worshiped gods that required prostitution, obviously is dropped a lot in this passage. Um, They worshiped gods that required human sacrifices. Oftentimes they would sacrifice their children. Um, It was destroying them, but they refused to stop. And you can see God is kind of beside himself. He was like, look, this is destroying you guys. And you guys still won't stop, right? So what he does, because they're not giving in, because there are natural consequences to sin. And they're not they're just not learning from those consequences. So Hosea, Hosea would have been a known prophet. And a prophet would be a very respected man amongst the community. And God had Hosea marry an unfaithful woman to help... God's people understand what their relationship to him had become. So Hosea, in the first three chapters, like I said, I'll I'll catch you guys up. Hosea marries this woman named Gomer. And Gomer has two children with other men that are not Hosea. And she begins to to, to prostitute herself. So now he has two kids that are not his kids. And his wife is prostituting herself, and she ends up in slavery because of her prostitution. And there's a lot of amazing prophecies within this, this book of Hosea, the way that, that their, their marriage 
kind of the, the, the culminates into a moment where he goes and he rescues her and he buys her out of slavery and she changes her ways and they have a happy marriage and it's a really beautiful story. Mm-hmm. So good for Hosea, but what God is trying to help them understand is like this is going to eventually happen with you guys. Is You guys are eventually, your sin is going to lead you into a slavery and I'm going to have to come and buy you out. Wow. And he's trying to help them understand just the pain that they're causing him. That like, we live in such a world where, where, where everyone can understand to an extent what a relationship with God would look like or at least whether they desire one with a relationship with God or not. But what God is trying to help them understand is like, man, like when you're rejecting God and when you, you're worshiping other things, is that's realistically who you are inside of a relationship with God. And none of us would, view our, would want to view ourselves in that light, obviously. But God gives us the scriptures to help us understand spiritually what we do to ourselves. Yeah. Come on, Nick. And what kind of person we are in a relationship with God. Yeah. Could be this. Right. right. So I think I think a couple things. I think for starters, in the kingdom, getting weak spiritually has become kind of normalized. Mm. And I think that's really strange. I don't think that that should be a, a very normal like state to become in. Like if you like were to tell your friends or people that you can confide in and usually, you know, confess your sin to and people who are spiritual mentors to you, usually you can tell them like, oh, like I think I just got like really weak spiritually. And you're talking about like a six month stint of like time in your life. And, and generally the response is like, oh yeah, you know, amen. Well, I'm glad you pulled out, you know what I mean? And it's very fluffy and we try and encourage each other because kind of almost everyone has been there yeah. at some point where we've gotten weak spiritually. But I think that it's such an odd thing to normalize. I don't think that being weak spiritually should be a, a, a normalized, like socially acceptable thing in the kingdom. As I was reading this passage, I was like, oh, like that's so bad that we get weak spiritually and, and drift into a place where in a relationship with God, we become this person, right? Because just think about it. Is imagine that you had a spouse. Just imagine you had a spouse, right? Um, guard your hearts, but just imagine, right? Um, so imagine cheating on your spouse because you got weak spiritually. Imagine cheating on your spouse because you got weak spiritually. Right? Okay. So imagine not coming home to your spouse because you got weak spiritually. You just went somewhere else because you got weak spiritually. Imagine confiding in, relying on someone else other than your spouse because you're going through things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Jody, <Jordy's like, laughs> Ima- This one. Imagine losing faith in your spouse because you're faithless. See, the, so these things, what we just came to con- conclusion on right now, I think, no one said anything verbally, but I think I can, you know, <laughs> read body language well, um, is these things, they're not actually spiritual symptoms. Wow. These things are not symptoms of your, your, your spirituality or like lack of spirituality. Is what these things are, they're unspiritual and sinful decisions. Wow. Mm-hmm. It's not a symptom from how you're doing spiritually. Mm-hmm. You, the, Jesus said that blessed are those who are weak in spirit. You could be weak in spirit and be blessed by God, mm. right? So that seals the case, Seal it. right? Is being like depressed and sinful and drifting from God and drifting from the kingdom and drifting from your relationship with God and the kingdom, those are not symptoms of your spirituality. Those are decisions that we make when we're in sin, mm. right? So I think the decision that we all have to make is that we're not gonna allow ourselves to be weak spiritually. Is I think we have to do, we have to normalize like, that's just not in our vocabulary, that we're weak spiritually. If you're like weak in spirit and you're struggling, there's ways to get strong. Like, like it's, 
if you got a cold, I always do this when I get a cold, like when I'm just get like a little sick and Rachel knows this, I go grab all the, the cold medicine that's in my cabinet. She's shaking her head, so I'm not lying. The decongestion one, the one from mucus, the one for your throat. And I think there's like a, a headache one or something like that. I don't know. But it's like a good three or four of them and I just, I pop them in the morning, at night, I get a good night's sleep. I'll make sure I get real tired so I can get like a really good night's sleep. And I just tough it out. And I wait for the medicine to do its job. Get those little vitamin C packets and stuff like that. Like there's things that you can do to get stronger. But okay, right now I feel like crap. I'm sick. Okay, well I'm just going to do the right things and I'm going to keep going. Yeah. And I think we can totally do that. Is because whether it it's it's the it rains or whether the sun shines, whether it's seventy degrees outside or negative twenty degrees outside, like God is still God. Right. Jesus is still Lord. Whether it's raining or the sun is shining, whether it's like freezing, we're hiding in our homes, or like hey, like let's dress like Derek and go play volleyball. You know what I mean? Like God is still God. And we can still do well. We can still be happy. Yeah, come on, Nick. Right? We, we, we do seeking God studies with people, and we look over what seeking God with all our heart looks like. And, okay, well, if we, if we make a decision to give God our whole heart and seek Him with our whole heart, He'll give us joy. Is it, the, these are decisions that we make. Mm -hmm. That because I follow Jesus, because I seek God with my whole heart, I have joy. That's not an, an emotional you know, odometer that like, okay, I'm blessed today, but you know, yesterday I didn't really follow that blessed. <laughs> like, cause then how do we even know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. But the scriptures teach us, we give God our whole heart. Yeah. Right. Our last wedding passage for this morning. Come on, Nick. I'm gonna be Let's look at revelation chapter 21. Oh. <laughs> this is actually a really encouraging passage. Funny. People get freaked out when you go, let's go to Revelation. This is a cool passage. Come on, Nicholas. So it says in verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And there was no longer any sea. I'm kind of fired about that. I'm like scared of the ocean a little bit, you know? It says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and they will be with their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Um, yeah, verse 8 is a bit gnarly, but this is a really, this is a really encouraging passage, right? Um, I think there's, a, there's people who have kind of um, dove down the, the rabbit hole of like environmental awareness and whatnot and become, I think, what I call like environmental extremists and whatnot. Well, well, I think we should definitely be environmentally aware and know what our, our presence does to, you know, our environment. And we should, you know, God did create us to, to exist here and have good lives. So our lives shouldn't be destroying things. Um, but, but. The reason why I don't quite agree with environmental extremism is this passage right here, it, it helps us to kind of understand the big picture because if you go back to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, God created this place and it was like light work. He just did it. It was easy. He took his time to do some things. He did things with just, by just speaking words. 
he waited for certain things to develop. He just kind of did his thing and it took him six days and everything that you see was created, right? So God could obviously do whatever he wants. <laughs> and the Bible says that one day we are going to get a complete, like, brand new home. <laughs> a ranch. I don't know. It doesn't quite say a ranch, but... It says a new earth and a new heaven, and it says that God will dwell with us there, and it's just going to be incredible. It's going to be a place where, 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 where sin has never even existed. It's going to be a place where death has never even existed. It says that we're going to be crying when we get there. It's going to be so beautiful we'll be crying. He's going to wipe our tears. Just imagine that. It's very rare to, to I think... Well, for me, at least, if you've ever cried out of being happy, right? Like happy tears. We all have heard the term happy tears. But, um, but in the passage, what he said right there in, in verse 2, it says that this, this holy city, this new Jerusalem coming down from heaven, from God, is going to be prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And, and I thought about when I saw my wife walk down the aisle. And um, I got a little teary eyed. I'm not even joking. This morning I was reading this passage, and I got a little teary. I was like, Oh, snap, like it's still there. And I kind of like, dude, that's crazy. Like that was a, it was a, a core memory, like e immediately. Is I'll never forget what she looked like when she walked down the aisle. And I'm like, dude, this could be so amazing going to heaven. Like if that's what it's comparing to, like the, the approach to heaven is going to be like seeing your wife come down the aisle. And I'm like, geez, like that's absolutely amazing. Right? So... To, to see how excited that God is to see us is what I think of. Because throughout Scripture, the church is the bride to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, that is so encouraging. That, that is how Jesus feels about you and I. He's just so excited to see us, like, approaching our new home. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. But... Being married, it, there, there's, there's consequences. It's a consequential, consequential agreement. Absolutely. Because one of the things that made me so happy is I, as I saw Rachel walking down the aisle and you know, her dad was bringing her to me, is I'm like, this is amazing. Everybody knows what's about to happen right here. Even her dad knows. Her dad is about to give her to me. <laughs> Like, like seriously, so, so think like, like spir spiritual lens through what we understand marriage as from what the Bible has given us is everybody knows in about like two, three minutes is she's mine. Yeah. Is this is my wife and we'll become one. Yeah. Right? Even her dad understood that. She, he is giving her away. That's what they call it yep. yeah. in a wedding ceremony. Right? Okay. So Jesus is the bridegroom. Church is the bride. All right. Do the people in your life know that you belong to Jesus? Like, do you belong to Jesus in that way? Or do you just want to be treated that way? It's like hilarious. In the 21st century, people want to act like they're married with like their booze or whatever. And they start like acting like they're married like after they've been dating six months. I'm like, you guys are nuts, dude. That's stupid. That is like how you jack up a relationship really good, right? So we like to, to act like we're kind of in relationships like that, right? But we got to make sure that that's not our relationship to Jesus, yeah. that we belong to Jesus, yeah. that that's known, mm -hmm. right? Because this passage is it's in a really interesting part of the Bible is all of the book of Revelation is written in very um, apocalyptic language. Um, and a lot of it is the, the other part that's not apocalyptic is really is about Jesus and what he did for us mm -hmm. on the cross, right? So the message communicating Jesus being bloodied up and tortured and hung up on a cross dead in front of his mom, mm -hmm. right? Essentially is what the first couple of chapters really did tell us is what he did right it makes him the only appropriate candidate to play that role in our life yeah. that in the same way right now on planet earth there are zero candidates to be rachel's husband yeah. they don't exist 
that there is no uh, appropriate situation where there could be a potential candidate ever, ever again. As far as we're concerned, right now, I'm alive and I'm breathing and I'm well. You, you know what I mean? But we understand that very true. Like, okay, yeah, absolutely. Like, Rachel is, like, off the market. No one can, you know, try and, like, like chat her up in that kind of way or anything like that without some pretty, like, serious repercussions. You, you know what I mean? Is we know that that's true. We know that's appropriate. But, like, okay, if that is who Jesus is to us, well, who else is in your life that is, fill, if that is filling that role that belongs to him? Wow. Yeah, I would freak out, man. I would freak out. And I'm a, I'm a human being. I'm not God. Yeah. I'm not God. But when we, when we have like spiritual adultery against God and we cheat on Jesus and we let other things take that place, it's like gross. Yeah. Is that's the worst thing you could do to another human being? Right. right? But, but we'll do that to God. Mm. I have spiritual adultery. Yeah. You know, it says in uh, it says in verse seven, it says that he who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So, so the whole challenge of, of life, it really is overcoming all of these temptations yeah. in a real way to replace God in our life, which we're obviously so drawn to when you, you turn the news on. We love to do it. We're good at it at this point, talented, right? But all he asks is that we do not emulate verse 8. Is as long as that's not your life, as long as you overcome these things, and I'm in the rightful place in your life. You will be my child. He's, he's using, you know, human expressions to, to, to help us understand what the relationship is. He uses um, a, a father to a child. He uses, you know, the idea of marriage and the excitement and anticipation to a wedding. He likens it to these things. Obviously, we're not going to know till we get there. Is we understand that the Bible is God trying to communicate to us, you know, using human understandings to kind of help us get there in our in our minds but when we overcome these things right it says we'll inherit all of this and it'll be an amazing thing so i i, I think back to um i don't know why this came to my mind but i remember back in 2020 during the uh, the pandemic and um raul moreno was preaching all the way from like sao paulo um and I'm like, man, I, I wonder what the time difference is. Like these preachers are like preaching. It's like two in the morning over where they're at and they're preaching for us. It's, you know, so incredible of them. But um, he had just converted his, uh, his, his father, I think. His father um, was dying, uh, like terminal cancer or something like that. And he baptized his dad at like the last moments. And he, he said that his dad told him, I just want to go to heaven. And it kind of struck a chord with Raul. And he, he kind of caused to create like a new hashtag. It was hashtag, I just want to go to heaven. It was all over Facebook and stuff, wherever disciples are at on social media. And I'm like, man, like we need to get back to that. Or like at the end of the day, like I want to go to heaven. And like that's my main priority. Like that's at the, the, that, that's at the fore, like at the same, the, in the same way that like I have a core memory it takes up like the, a pretty frontal piece of my brain. I remember my wife walking down an aisle. I'll never forget it. I was like literally almost crying all over again while I'm reading the passage and trying to think about it. Is it, that has to be similarly at the forefront of our brains. That man, I want to be loyal to God. Yeah. Like I want to make it to that party because that's going to be a sick party. Yeah. I, I love weddings here ran by a bunch of like evil people because that's what Jesus said in the gospels. He's like, look, if you know how to give your children good gifts and you're evil, how much more will I not give you good gifts? Yeah. Right? So at the end of the day, we're all evil. Yeah. And I'm like, man, we know how to put on a wedding big. I could not uh, imagine a party that is, is, is literally for us. Yeah. It's for us. I'm like, man, I just want to, I want to catch that party. I don't want to miss that party. And he deserves it is I'm not going to cheat on my God. I'm going to be faithful to my God. 
is he is the only, only candidate. No one else could fill his shoes. Could never replace him with anybody else. For everything that he, that he did to redeem us, that we can even have a chance to overcome these things. Like it, in Romans, it says that we were once just dead in our sins. And when we were dead in our sins, Jesus died for us. So we're absolutely useless and covered in sin. We had no hope of escaping it. And he gave us a door. He created something that was not there. So we can overcome these things. But it's got to be at the forefront of our minds. And it's got to be why we do what we do. Is I want to be faithful to God. And I want to go to heaven. Amen, guys. Amen. Let's uh